Please rise. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen. A section of God's Word that guides our thoughts today is a portion of Psalm 19, written by King David. He writes, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Here ends the word. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ, what can we do to motivate one another to open our Bibles and regularly ponder a passage or two? What, what can we do? What can we use to encourage each other to do that? To just think about God's Word. Well, I suppose we could use threats, right? Threats, that's a powerful motivator. Just think of kids in school. We're going to have a test next Friday. You better study or you're going to fail the test and you're going to have to do this all over again. That's a powerful motivator. Well, we could say, you know, God's going to be angry with you. There are going to be some dire consequences if you don't study the Word. Threats are powerful. We could also use shame. James, another powerful motivator, we could say something like, well, you know, a real Christian would study the Bible at least five minutes a day. If you really loved the Lord, you'd, you'd listen to what he says in his word. That's shame, isn't it? And that too is a powerful motivator. So we've got threats and we've got shame. And there's another even more powerful motivator motivator. And that is to simply lay out all the good things that come from studying God's Word. I think David understood that. David was the one who wrote this psalm before us because in the psalm he celebrates God's Word. If you look at these few verses, it really is a, a joyful celebration of God's Word. He highlights the good things that come from the Word and then he lets the reader apply things to their own life. Let's look at this beautiful celebration of the Word, finding motivation for ourselves to dig in to God's Word. As we look at this poem, there are two things we want to keep in mind that really flow through the whole poem. One is that name Lord, L-O-R-D in all capital letters in our English version. The editors of our Bible are letting us know in the Hebrew language a a special word is used here, Yahweh, Jehovah. We're not sure how to pronounce it. The name of God. When the Old Testament people heard that name of the Lord, two thoughts came to mind. One, He exists, because the Hebrew word really means I am. I exist. So when they heard this name, they thought, well, this is the one God who actually exists. And then secondly, this name is used when some blessing is being bestowed upon the people. You know, God's rescuing him or his message of the gospel is proclaimed. Some blessing is associated with the term Lord. And the second thing we want to remember is a Hebrew a literary device called parallelism. And that is the author will write something and then say it again with different words. And say it again with different words. And say it again. You know, parallel thoughts. Uh, that runs through this whole uh, section that we're looking at. The topic is God's Word. And six different times in six different ways, David highlights the Word. He calls it the law of the Lord, the statutes, precepts, commands, fear, ordinances. No matter what he calls it, he's talking about the Bible. So in parallel thought, he lays the topic out before us. The Word of God and some blessing that follows. With those two thoughts in mind, parallelism and the Lord, with those two thoughts running through the whole 
section. Let's look at this beautiful celebration of the word. In the first verse, David begins this way. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. When you and I hear the word law, I'm guessing we immediately think of uh, do's and don'ts, regulations, you shall and you shall not. But for the Jewish people, they had a much broader understanding. You see, this word translated law is the Torah. The Torah. And, and when God's people heard that, they understood this is, that's the whole Bible. You know, all of Genesis, all of Exodus, and so on. The Torah was God's word, not just the do's and do nots. So, God's word is what we're talking about here. He says it is um, perfect. The, the Hebrew word for perfect means all sided, multifaceted, we might say, or all encompassing. It, it covers the bases of life, covers all aspects of life. It's not that God's word gives a specific answer to every specific question you and I might have. But rather, God's Word lays down general principles that you and I can apply to all areas of life. Those two basic messages, of course, are law and gospel. The law teaches us what is right and wrong, and the gospel relieves that burden of guilt and shame. These things, David says, cover all the areas of life. And David goes on to say, the Torah revives the soul. When you and I hear that, we probably think of the gospel, right? The gospel revives the soul. Think of how, how horrible we feel when we've sinned. It's like a, a heavy weight is on our shoulders, the guilt and the shame, and then the gospel comes along and removes that burden. It gives us life. It refreshes us. It revives us. That's what David is talking about. The gospel revives the soul. So why study the Word? Why study the Word? Because it covers all the bases of life and it revives the soul. That's David's first answer. Let's go on and see the second one. He says, the statutes, the Word of God, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. God's Word is trustworthy. Another translation is reliable or it provides a firm foundation. That's the idea David was talking about. Upon what can I build my life? What's going to be the solid foundation? You know, in David's day, just like today, people looked for something solid, stable, secure, upon which they could build their life. Some people look to their, to their property, to their wealth. You know, I'll look to my money. That gives me security. Other people look to maybe education or science, just like we do today. That'll give me a, a sure foundation. All kinds of things upon which people would build their lives. But, but those were feeble foundations. You know, finances go up and down with the passage of each day, don't they? And what we think is true in science today, we find out tomorrow, oh, I guess we were wrong. The one sure, stable, reliable foundation is God's Word. David says it gives you wisdom to anyone who is searching for the answers to the deep questions of life. God's Word says, come, come read me. I'll, I'll share wisdom with you. Deep questions. What are those? Oh, the same questions people have always wrestled with. Why are we here? What's my purpose in life? Why is there suffering and sorrow in this world? And most importantly, what happens on the other side of the cemetery? You know, those are the big, deep questions of life that everybody wrestles with. God's Word provides the wisdom. So why study the Word? Because it provides a solid foundation for life and it provides wisdom. David's not done yet. He goes on, the precepts, that is the word. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. God's word is right, it is correct, it is true. No, no error error can be found in it. 
You know, Jesus said the same thing in a prayer he prayed. He said, Father, your word is truth. The word is true. God's word was the absolute standard of truth. You know, Pontius Pilate asked a a great question. He said, what is truth? He asked Jesus that question when he was trying Jesus. What is truth? You know, Pilate was sort of a skeptic, sort of a modern day thinker, I believe, because in our day, people wonder, is there any sort of absolute truth? The Bible is that truth. And that gave David reason to rejoice. There was no deception, nothing false, no lie whatsoever in the word. Oh, how different that was from everything else in David's life. There was finally something true, and that gave him joy. David goes on, Commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. That's a frequent uh, illustration in Scripture, isn't it? That God's Word is a light shining in the darkness of this world. God's law shines uh, on the, the light of the light on, the, on our path of what's right and what is wrong. God's word also shines light on the path of how to get to heaven. And it's only God's word that shines light on that path, how to get to heaven. You know, in the words right before our scripture text, Psalm 19, the words right before it, David explored the beauty of creation. He says, nature proclaims God's existence. You know, as we go out and we look at the stars, the the beautiful woods, or the rivers and the lakes, this all cries out, somebody made me. As you and I look at the beauty of creation, we certainly see God's wisdom and his power, his interest in beauty and diversity. He could have made a plain world, but he didn't. We see all kinds of things about the Lord. But when we look at the heavens, we don't learn about Jesus. When we go out to the woods and the lakes, we we don't hear, Jesus died for your sins. No, it's only in the Word that this light shines on our path. Well, let's go on. David has a couple of more things to say. He says, The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. Fear of the Lord. David calls this book, or the half of it that he had, the Old Testament, he calls it the fear of the Lord. Remember, this is Hebrew parallelism. The subject is the Bible. Different names, but the subject is still the Bible. So David calls this book the fear of the Lord. Why would he do that? He's simply uh, using what the Bible produces, fear, as a name for the Bible itself. The Bible produces fear, and I suppose in two ways. One is is terror. When God's Word announces judgment, there is sort of a trembling, a terror. I'm afraid. But then when God's Word comes and announces forgiveness, you and I are just in awe. How could He forgive me? There's a sort of amazement or awe. That's a different type of fear, more respect than terror. So this book produces both of those, and and David takes what is produced, and he uses it as a name for the book. This is the fear of the Lord, right here. Well, David says it's pure. It's pure. To help us understand what David means there, we just need to think about the process of refining precious metal. And when precious metal is dug out of the earth, huge uh, machines dig out big chunks of rock, ore it's called, right? And that needs to be crushed and processed and all the impurities taken out so that what remains is the gold or the silver or whatever the precious metal is. David takes that simple idea and applies it to God's word. It's absolutely pure. No imperfections whatsoever in God's word. And David says, therefore, it endures. It endures forever. What a treasure. What a treasure. You know, in David's day, 
people looked for pure things, pure silver, pure gold, pure gemstones with no imperfections. Oh, the ultimate treasure is God's Word. Nothing impure. It endures forever. Well, with a a final flourish of words, David goes on to say God's Word is sure and righteous and precious and sweet. It warns and rewards. I'll just focus in on those last two thoughts. It warns and it rewards. God's Word certainly warns. We've talked about how the Word shows right from wrong, and then it announces consequences too, right? The wages of sin is death. That is a warning. But God's Word also rewards or blesses people. Think of any of the commandments and the blessings that come from paying attention to them. Think of the fourth commandment. Fourth commandment says, children, honor your mother and father that it may go well with you. Doesn't it go well for children when they honor mom and dad? Of course it does. Or think of the seventh commandment. It talks about respecting one another's property. Doesn't life go better for us if we respect one another's property? Absolutely. And then, of course, think about our eternal future. The Bible offers great blessings for those who believe in Jesus. God's Word certainly provides all these warnings and all these blessings. So now, getting back to the original question, how can we motivate ourselves? How can we encourage one another to just open up the Bible and ponder a passage or two regularly? What can you and I hope to gain by studying this ancient book. You know, it's thousands of years old. What can we hope to gain by it? All the very things David highlighted. Our souls will be revived. We will be made wise. God will give us something solid and sure and true upon which we can build our lives. David celebrates the Word of God. He does that in another psalm too. In Psalm 119, this is Psalm 19. Go home and read Psalm 119. That's a little longer celebration of God's Word. See, David must have understood. If we lay before people the blessings that come from studying the Word, they'll be motivated themselves to dig into it. You notice David didn't use any threats He didn't say, if you don't study God's Word, bad things are going to happen. He didn't use shame. He didn't say, you know, a real believer would spend some time each day studying the Word. No, he just highlighted the blessings. I pray that as the Holy Spirit inspired David to write this poem, it will inspire us to dig into the Word. God grant that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please rise. Thank <clears throat> you.